Welcome to Geocache Adventures with me, Shadow Dragon One, where I discuss geocaching and my adventures with it. This interview was recorded using Zoom and may sound different than other podcast audio. Hello, everybody. Shadow Dragon One, Amy here. Uh, welcome to Geocache Adventures. I have with me Dan, fellow geocacher and the lead designer at DPH Games, a company that created a geocaching game. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Thanks for having me. First of all, let me ask you, how did you get started in geocaching? So geocaching, I th- it was uh, 2007, and I got one of those Christmas cards from a friend of mine with a letter and how their family was doing and, you know, about each of the kids, and then the, the wife had written it, and she mentioned her husband, and it just said, Charlie started geocaching, look it up. <laughs> and I looked it up. And I was like, oh, this sounds cool. So started geocaching in like January 2008 or seven. I'm not sure which now um, in upstate New York, which was really, you know, if you can take it through that freezing all these frozen <laughs> geocaches, it was much more enjoyable in the spring and summer. But that, that's what got us started down the road. That's a neat little twist. A Christmas card led to a hobby. Yep. So what kind of, if you, you've been caching since about 2008, 2007, what kind of stats do you have currently? Well, um, I had to change my profile back in the day. It's not, I probably around seven, I'm embarrassed, <laughs> <laughs> probably around 700 geocaches just because um, uh, I forget to record a lot of them. And then oh. <laughs> um, like a bunch and then once I started the company with the geocaching game in 2013, it actually made it really hard to geocache because I was traveling around to geocaching events, but I'm at the vendor booth the whole time. So oh. I'm not going out and getting caches. Um, so, and then, but kind of a, a funny story of my old age is I was out hiking this summer and I'm like, wow, there's, there's a cache nearby. I'll go get it. I'm like, man, this looks familiar. This looks familiar. And I find the cache. I go back to log it and I found it five years ago. Just oh. <laughs> remember. So uh, not, a, not a new cache. I've never done one of the power trails to boost numbers and stuff. But um, so probably, you know, I might actually be like around a thousand or so. Not, not a ton uh, for this amount of time. But I've I probably got my first 500 in the first three years, and then this whole geocaching game thing got in the way. (laughs) Darn life getting in the way of things. (laughs) Yep. So that's how, that's, that's the geocaching history. Okay, so let's talk about DPH games. Does that stand for anything, DPH? It does. Um, It's, it's Daniel... Peter Hunzik, which is my sort of my full name, although I don't actually have a middle name, but that's a whole other story we don't need to get into. So it's just the abbreviation. Um, but um, I do have a guy that helps me a lot going to conventions, and his name is Patrick. And so people are like, who's the H? We, we've met Dan and we've met Patrick. So we, we have to that's find funny. someone that's like I travel around with us whose name is an H. You'll have to uh, find a, a Henry or Henry. A Howard. <laughs> yeah, Howard Harry. That's funny. So you said you started DPH in 2013. What what inspired you to do that? So earlier that year, I um, uh, introduced a friend of mine to geocaching, and he went nuts he was just going every night after work and it was crazy so his kids wanted to have a geocaching themed birthday party and um january again upstate new york there's no way to hide stuff in his backyard because he'd see the tracks in the snow and um then uh we thought well i'll just i'll go out and buy a geocaching board game and um there wasn't one. <laughs> so kind of made this up, brought it to the party. No one there was geocachers other than he and I, but they played the game as it was at the time. And um, uh, they said, you should do something with this. 
and that led to um, the starting of the company. And, and the game as it is now would be the cash me if you can board game, correct? Correct. Okay, so that's, a, that's your first game essentially that launched everything. Yes. <sighs> that's, that's pretty neat. So can yeah. you tell us about the board game? Give us a brief overview for anybody who's not familiar with it. Sure, it's, um, it's in its fourth printing. So there's been some modifications and changes to it. Um, it comes in an ammo can looking box. Um, and it uh, has three game boards uh, in it. One is like a town board and then the other two are woods with a, with a trail. And you put these tiles down out in the woods in the town, you can get equipment. Uh, you can go to a geocaching mega event, get solve cards. Uh, out in the woods, there's hazards. There's caches of um, of different types. So to get a traditional cache, you just need to find it. But like to get a night cache, you have to have a flashlight. So it's you know it's getting the right equipment, uh, the right caching, and you can <clears throat> or caching equipment, and you can um, you know use maps and stuff to sort of peek at tiles out in the, in the woods. Um, it's a two to four player game, although we are working on a, I'm actually probably 80% done on a solo uh, rule set for it. So you can play uh, against AI geocachers. Um, but uh, it's, it's basically a race to who can collect the most points. I did forget there's geocoins in there and they all have a uh, a mission that once if you can achieve the uh mission of the geocoin you get additional points oh that's pretty cool what's the recommended age range for players is it like uh, six and up or eight and up? i would i would i would say eight i mean the for crazy Amazon legal reasons, it's going to say 12 and up, but, um, <laughs> but the, uh, but eight, eight is, is okay. 10. Yeah. It's usually it's the, the kids are pretty good with picking it up and, and running with it. Sometimes it's, it should say under 60. Um, <laughs> cause people have <laughs> brought up playing Monopoly and all this stuff sometimes have a harder time. Okay. So it's the official rating is a little bit older, but a little bit younger kids may be just fine with it. Yeah, I, I don't know that I'd go to six. I mean, you do, again, it's the age stuff is tough because there's some kids I've met that are way smarter than me. Um, <laughs> but uh, it does involve some reading. You have, you have event cards that you keep secret. So it's not super high level reading, but you have to be able to you know, read to save this card and use it in this situation. Right. So, so probably wow. eight to 10, yeah. like you said, or, you know, possibly a bit younger with help. It sounds like. Yeah. I, we've had people do that um, at geocaching events and game nights that have gone to like a kid will sit with their parent and they play as a team. And that, that definitely, you know, has worked. Okay. So that's good to know. So you, you mentioned the board game came about as the idea for the birthday party, but so how do you go from you, you have this idea and you've made your prototype to actually selling games to people? Well, that's a whole. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably a very big question. <laughs> um, it is. Uh because that game that we brought to the party was really just the initial idea. And then that friend of mine, there was actually a local gaming convention in his town. He's like, you got to get up here. And we went there and we met some people that were very helpful and kind of brought it more into modern board gaming. Um, made some changes to, to make that improve it. And then we're able to go out and start actually testing it at gaming conventions. So we went for months playing the game with non geocachers all over the place, which was kind of funny, but they were, they were cool. They were in, you know, they, they were into it. They had feedback and, um, 
one of my favorite stories is once we finally produced it and there's this young couple and they, they love board games and they bought the board game and then they sent me a picture a week later of them getting their first geocache because they've never been geocaching. Oh, that's and fun. So um, I work in an office where we all rent desks. And so it's a, a think tank, I guess. Um, and so I had some business help there. And we started a, a corporation um, to get some shareholders. And um, so did some financing and then just started learning what to do along the way <clears throat> in terms of graphic design and art and then finding a manufacturer. And, um, and then as I've, we've produced more games, um, we've made more connections and some of that's much more streamlined. Um, so it's a lot of testing, a lot of, um, uh, you know, playing with different groups of people. And then it's, uh, I don't know, <laughs> compiling all of getting, getting the art, getting the graphic design, um, getting the rules, uh, all together and and then you send it off um the last one we we social we funded a, um on kickstarter so we had some people back the game ahead of time and help pay for the fourth edition the fourth edition i should mention adds in um, battery life and um uh, health so before you'd run into a pricker bush and you just go to the hospital now you lose a, a couple of health heart tokens and once you lose four heart tokens you go to the hospital oh. and every time you reveal a cache you you lower your battery life and then there's a there's a, a couple of advanced they're not super advanced but advanced set of rules where there where there's terrain and cache difficulty levels so you can assign difficulty levels to the to the caches okay so the players assign the difficulty levels uh, your opponents do oh, the it. opponents. Okay. So it's a, it's kind of a, <clears throat> it's well, if it's more than two players, it's like a bidding system. Whoever bids the highest difficulty level, that cash becomes that. Oh. You have to roll a dice. Basically, you're uh, rolling a ten-sided die, and it and the result has to be higher than the combined uh, terrain difficulty and cash difficulty. So if it's a three terrain and a for difficulty cash after all eight or higher. Oh, okay. So the problem is, as I'm assigning that difficulty to the cash you're after, if you don't get it, I can try to come and get that cash later. But if I've made it very difficult, it's going to be very difficult for me too. So um, it, it's an interesting little game within the game. And but that's that's the advanced rules for people that have played it a few times. Oh, that's neat. It sounds interesting. So it, it challenges not just the person creating not just the opponent but even the person creating the difficulty yes okay that's cool so i saw on your website you guys have a zombie apocalypse expansion pack yes we do so uh, <laughs> that just sounds amazing to start with so <laughs> the, the, the prince, well how that started was actually at that birthday party one of the other wise guy board gamer says oh you need a zombie expansion pack and i'm like you know every game unless i can come up with something different i am not going to do just a zombie expansion pack however um what happened was this is different in that basic and every geocacher gets it and they laugh is that the game essentially doesn't change your goal is the same is to go get geocaches except, except now you're just doing it during the zombie apocalypse because <laughs> you're not <laughs> gonna let that get in the way so yeah. you're not really hunting zombies you're not i mean you have to try to you defend yourself against them and all that kind of stuff and if you do fall prey to one of the zombies you become one um but as a zombie, the will to geocache is strong, and so you continue to geocache as a zombie. I um, love it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's 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 kind of kind of wild. But um, we did at one point have a superhero ge geocaching expansion, um, and it was designed that you could actually. It got crazy, but you could combine, you could do superhero geocaching during the zombie apocalypse, which 
geocaching started to sort of fade away at that point because there was so much going on, but it was so, so kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> that would be quite the combination. Superheroes, yeah, zombies, and geocaching. <laughs> yeah. And if you, I mean, the, the, the terror was if, because the, the players were all superheroes, and so if one of the superheroes turned into a zombie, it was a little... You know, if you had the ability to fly and you're a zombie, it was a little terrifying. <laughs> yeah, that, that would get very but, chaotic, I could imagine. Yeah, we, we get a limited run of those. And they're, they're, so when you do that kind of thing, it's pretty expensive to produce. And so, you know, what we had to charge for what you were getting just didn't feel like, you know, you kind of have an idea when you're buying a game how much you're going to pay for how what components. and. Right we were basically breaking even or losing money every time we sold one. So we, we, there's a number of people that have that out there, but um, I should look online. Maybe they're going <laughs> people are reselling them for some ridiculous amount because they're out of print. You know what? You never know, especially these days. <laughs> yep. Speaking of these days being different, how has COVID and the pandemic affected you guys? Because you've mentioned before that you go to events, and I'm guessing that has sort of limited the event options. Yeah, um, basically one of our major streams of, of making money is conventions. Um, so geocaching events and board game conventions, and for obvious reasons, none of those have happened this year. Um, you know, so it's not been great. Um, for example, Gen Con um, in Indianapolis is a game convention that has about 70,000 people a day. So we'll probably see a few thousand people coming by our booth and, and whatever. And so they did it online this year and we interacted with 28 people. So it's oh, wow. a bit of a drop off. Um, you know, but it's but it's uh, fortunately there's a, a thing called um, tabletop simulator. So what's ended up happening is we're spending a lot of time in development. Um, I have play testers that are local here at Upstate New York, and then I had some another group that was an hour away, and then another group that's a few hours away at Harrisburg. And because now we're doing this all online, they've intermixed and got to meet each other, and it's been kind of interesting. Um, but the good thing is the online thing is just not as satisfying. And so when we are able to get together again, it, just sitting around the table playing a board game is so much better. Yeah, definitely. Online games are, are great to have available, especially right now when you can't really get together in a lot of places. But yeah, there's something about just playing in person that it's just so much better. <laughs> Right, and it's it's the main reason that I'm doing this is is to, you know, with all the people you meet and, um, and and to sit around and just have fun with a group of people, um, just to you know. So I kind of mentioned in the development of the geocaching game, we were at conventions playing with people, and you know they don't know what a geocoin is, and and they don't know they get an event card that says you've been stopped by the police. They're like they they go oh okay but they don't chuckle because they don't quite get, you know, that that's, that's never happened to them. And so when we were finally able to bring it to geocachers, it was kind of crazy to watch because it's just like, you know, laughing and saying, Oh my God, this is all the stuff that happens to, to me, you know, and um, it's just that interaction is what, you know, drives, drives motivates me. So it's been a, uh, you know, a long year for, for us, but it's been a long year for a lot of people, so I'm not complaining. I know as of right now, there is, I believe it's called MOGA, the geocaching event in Kentucky for next Memorial Day 2021. Mm -hmm. Are there plans for you guys to be there at that event? Um. So that's been the, the theme of the year is it's been impossible to plan anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I probably personally will not attend a large gathering until I have a vaccine. And I'm pretty low on the list, so I don't know. <laughs> um, 
maybe yeah it's it's kind of crazy my mom and i were she i got my mom introduced into geocaching and she's super excited and i showed her the event because it's about four hours from us and she was really wants to go with me but at the same time we're like well with covid who knows what we're going to actually be able to do or if they'll actually be able to have the event in the end but yeah um, I'm excited when they get going, but um, we typically have attended uh, Allegheny Start State Park Geobash, Midwest Geobash um, out by west of Toledo, Ohio, which is a crazy three-day one. Um, the uh, New Jersey, gee, you know, it's been so long now, I'm forgetting the names of them. That's sad. Uh, uh, Metro Geobash down in Jersey. Berkshire ended a couple years ago, so that's not going on. Um, and and then if uh, like Moga has kind of it depends. Moga wandered up into Athens, Ohio one year, so he went to that. Um, and then uh, Geo Woodstock, depending on where that lands, I'm assuming they're going to do it in Seattle again, but I don't I don't know um, if that's going to happen. And um, but yeah, I'm like I'm going like one week at a time. <laughs> yeah, I can't I can't blame you for that. It's yeah, it's just an insane year that I don't think has gone the way anybody anticipated ever. So nope. Oh, do you remember what the first geocaching event was that you took the board game to? It would have been. Um... Allegheny State Park event, which is a mega, um, you know, about 600 people. It's, it's um, Western New York. And um, they had like a, I guess, Chinese auction where you put your tickets in bags for things, right, to win. Is that, I guess uh, that's what you call it. Like a, um, like a raffle drawing? Yeah. Yeah. But, you, you know, they have bags sitting around a table next to the items. And so you put your. Okay. Buy tickets and you put them in the things that you wanted and okay. so we had we had donated a, a game and the bag was full um and the problem was you know we sold some games but i had to learn but we missed out on a lot of sales because people were like well i'm waiting to see if i win it and oh. then the auction was the last thing and then everyone went home and it was like yeah, we're not doing that again, you know, we'll <laughs> raffle off t-shirts or, you know, um, uh, gift certificates or something else. But uh, it's just human nature. I mean, if you're going to get one for free, why would you, you know, why would you buy it? Right. Um, so we, we, we learned our first year. We still sold a, a fair number, but it was kind of like, oh, yeah, maybe we shouldn't do that again. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you learn from it, right? <laughs> That's the important yeah. part. So you guys also have a card game version. Yes. And is it the same goal to get the most number of points or is it a different goal? It is. Uh, what happens is it's the style of game is called a press your luck game. So you keep flipping cards off the deck. Um, if you get two hazards, you bust and you lose all the cards in that lineup. Um, what you're trying to do is get coordinate a coordinates card along with geocache types of geocaches and some are again traditional caches which you can end your turn at any time and collect but you know there's two out there and there's one hazard maybe i should just stop and collect them now but maybe i can flip one more card and that's the pressure less luck aspect and if that card is a hazard then you bust and loot you don't get any of those caches okay. um you can also end your turn by collecting a piece of equipment so there's things like flashlights and, and jackets and stuff. And you go through the deck three times. And so in that same situation where you have a, a one hazard out, a, a coordinates card and maybe a couple of caches and you flip the next card and it's pricker bushes. And normally you would bust, but if you have gloves, if you have the heavy gloves, uh, you won't bust, you just discard that card. Oh, okay, um, so some of the equipment helps with the hazards. 
Yes. And so do you gather up a lot of equipment early on or do you collect caches? And so it's a pretty easy game to play and it plays pretty fast, but there's there's a, a fair amount to it. Um, there is one card in the deck, uh, the, the bear. And so when the bear comes out, you automatically bust. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> and it's, it's not good to see bears. And the third time through the deck, when the bear comes out, the game ends. And there's a, there's a couple other little twists and, and equipment and stuff in there, but that's, that's the core of it. About how long does it take to play? You said it was a pretty quick play. So we talking um, like 15, 15, 20 minutes. minutes. Okay. Yeah, 15 minutes. And, um, uh, yeah, it's, we brought out that, I want to say that was Berkshire. No, it might've been Midwest. I can't remember which, I just remember getting an email later from this, <laughs> from a, got a friend of mine through geocaching, but said, thanks a lot. We stayed up till 3 a.m. playing that stupid card game. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we just kept going over and over again. So oh, like, yeah, that's you're funny. Welcome. I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so comparatively, how long does the board game typically take? So two-player is about a half hour, and four-player is about an hour. The more players, it takes a little longer. Okay. Um, there's a uh, – and it tw twists and turns, and it's kind of funny because um, it was Cash the Line played it. They did a live – virtual play and you know it was online so it took longer because i have to tell you what i'm doing one person had the board in front of them and everyone had cameras you know i think uh one or two were in canada one's australia anyway so the, it, they start going through and they're, they're going through pretty quickly and it looks like someone's gonna win because you played at 15 points and i think she was at 12 or something and they said you know what let's play at 18 because we want it to go longer and what happened is somebody played a card where she lost points and then it went on like another, it's not, it wasn't designed to do that. So I think it took them like an hour and a half, almost two hours to play because that little extension they did. Oh, wow. Everything spun differently and they were like, oh, well, it was just going so smoothly. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but hazards come out and stuff. So, but normally it's about, it's about an hour you know, for four players. It's about an hour game. So for the card game, is that also two to four players, or what's the player range on that one? Yeah, it's listed as two to four, so it is two to four. Um, I mean, you could probably try it with five. Um, there just might not be enough cards to do that. So, um, and actually, there's a again, we have a solo set of rules for that. That people that order it from us, we just attach the solo set in. But oh, okay. They're not final, final, fully tested. So you guys have quite a few different kinds of games here. Looking at your website, you've got an Inca Empire. You've got Psychological Warfare. You've got mm -hmm. Cats, a sad but necessary cycle of violent predatory behavior. You, you have quite the variety of, of board games here. So I got to ask you, which one of all of your games is your favorite? Uh, no, I can't. It it really it really depends on what you're in the mood for. Um, so because I play in normal year, I'll play these at conventions quite a bit. Um, the Gate of Relay is a so it's called, it's a social deduction game so what that means is we're, uh, the group of us is trying to achieve a goal but hidden amongst the group is a few people that don't want us to and they're trying to subvert the entire thing and and you don't know who they are um so i've probably played affliction about 13 to 1400 times so when you play a game and that game is still it's still very I still see things happen in that one. And it's a very strategic game. It's about the Salem Witch Trials. It's historically accurate. But with the Gator Relay, there's just the social interaction is is really what it's about. Because, you know, I'm pretty sure you're a cultist. And, and that's, you know, and, but I'm not. And all the things a cultist would say are the same things investigators would say. And so um, at conventions with new groups of people, I would say Gator Relay is probably 
the, the favorite one. Um, but that's, it's, I really have a hard time saying favorites. Um, we had uh, uh, origins in Columbus, Ohio one year. We had so many people to send upon our booth that um, we had uh, four people playing the geocaching game. And one of them is, is a, a guy who's a big time gamer and a big time geocacher. And he already owned the game. I don't know. He just was, I think that year we, if you played so many games, you were getting buttons and stuff. And okay. so he wanted, he wanted to collect all these uh, buttons. So he, he came to play it. So he ends up, we didn't have enough people. He ends up teaching the game to everyone else for us. And we're like, I'm like, thank you. And I'm That's like, you guys great. are ready. Yeah, because he knew he knew in and out how to play it. So um, there's lots of great fun convention stories, and um, but yeah, favorite is tough because it has more to do with like how many thousands of times I've played <laughs> at that point in time. I, um, I imagine you've played quite a few board games uh quite a bit more often than the average player would just because of all your conventions and events you take them to <laughs> uh yeah yeah um I'm, I'm assuming so although there are some people that <laughs> play a lot give me a run for my money there <laughs> oh and especially with the pandemic what a great way to be able to still do something with geocaching, even if you're in an area where you can't really go out and cache, is to have a board game or card game option. So yeah. when I when I came across your website, I actually was was doing some research for another episode about winter caching, and I was looking for some geocaching related alternatives for people like me who do not like to go out in the cold, mm -hmm. and came across your board game in another blog article and I thought what a great idea to be able to geocache without having to go out into the cold and actually geocache. Yeah um, and that's who it's designed for and the, the first year we the, the first year we went to Midwest Geobash there's this huge like airport hangar they have all the vendors in, and there's a bunch of like tables set out with chairs and at the beginning, I, mean, I don't you know why people would do this, but they would come up and say, why would I buy a board game about a game, you know? And so I'm like, well, I don't know, but if I can sell to 1% of all the geocachers, that's still 60,000 games, I'll, I'll take it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but what happened is this, this at about one o'clock, this unbelievable torrential downpour happened. I mean, it was, I hadn't really seen anything quite like it. So everyone came running into the, building and it, it was going to go on for an hour or two so we couldn't swipe the credit card thing fast enough oh, there was wow. all the people so people were buying the game and then going out and playing it and then people were watching them playing it and coming buying the game and so you know i wanted to go back to the first couple of people like i don't know why anyone buy a geocaching game <laughs> <laughs> but they are <laughs> and they're having a great time so um yeah midwest has since set up that we can actually before the vending area opens run a few activities and people play the games and and that's really what sells it is you know you, you once you, once you've played it and see what it's like and how much it's like it simulates it's not the same obviously as geocaching but it simulates a lot of the experiences and and there's some devious things people can do and i have some stories of <laughs> sweet, innocent what i thought were sweet innocent uh geocachers that did some pretty nasty things <laughs> <laughs> it turned out they had a dark side to them <laughs> they loved it they just giggled that's fun it also seems like a great way to introduce people to kind of the the idea of geocaching you know, mm -hmm. like you said, it is different than actual geocaching, but it has a lot of the same aspects. And you did mention uh, the one couple bought your game and then went out geocaching because of it. Do you do you get a lot of stories like that from the, the um, non geocaching I, events? Well, I think early on, more than now, because what happened is we were going to board game conventions. And all we had was the geocaching game. So 
people would be like, what's this? You know, what's this? And then we came out with Psych Warfare, and so that sort of split us in half. And then Cats, and we split in thirds, and then Affliction, and on and on. And so now with uh, 10, whatever we got here, nine, nine games, um, it's pretty much geocachers spot the game now and then want to play it. Okay. It's kind, of, um, kind of what happens. So we haven't had that experience as much, but boy, starting out, it used to happen. Uh, a fair amount. That's neat to to know that your game helped introduce some people to the hobby. And then I yeah. like in my house, I am I am the geocacher. My husband is not. He humors me sometimes. I've introduced my mom to it. My sister doesn't do it, but I could get them to sit down. Well, granted, during non-pandemic times, we would we have about weekly family dinners every week or every other week. And a lot of times we'd end up playing games and I could definitely get them to sit down and play at least try it once and play a geocaching board game with me where I may not be able to convince them to go out <laughs> and geocache yeah, yeah. per se. So. And I, yeah, there's, like I said, the, uh, there are some differences in the fourth edition and where they came from is from all the other games, things I'd learned about, in, in developing the other games from bef from the first edition to the fourth. So things like the equipment deck, you don't just draw a card at random, but you, you have the deck where you can draw the top card, but there are three cards that are face up. Because when you go shopping, you choose what you want. Now, maybe they don't have the item you want, so then you can go random and take one off the top of the deck. But just little things like that, that where you have a little more agency in how the game is played and how it goes. Do you have any um, new editions of it coming out? Is the is the fourth edition pretty pretty recent, or has yeah the, the fourth edition came out last fall, I believe. Okay, so so no yeah, new was, ones in the work as of right now. No, that was a big that was a pretty big revamp, in, in the sense that we went through the rules and redid the rules and made them. Um, that's been gradually happening, but the the first edition I thought people read words and it was just like a uh, the rule book was just basically words. And so now it's much more graphical with, you know, this is, you know, this is how you move and this is that kind of stuff. So um, I think, and then sometimes questions would come up. And as a result of that, we could see, uh, oh, well, for example, this is a, 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 an amazing one that went through all the testing and everything. And no one ever read this this way, but there's the tiles on the board. Some of them, you know, or one-time things. So you hit it and then you remove it. The physical features like pricker bushes and cliffs and stuff, they stay for the duration of the game. But you might have something like take an event card. And at the bottom of the tile, it said replace when revealed. And meaning replace it with another tile. But we had a couple people take it as replace it on the board. Oh. <laughs> so it, it now says remove from play. Just, you know, not to... To, okay. to but that, those little things happen. Have you had a pretty good response to the, the changes in this latest edition? Yeah. Um, and it's hard because COVID started, so we didn't get, we would probably have a, you know, a lot of times at a convention, people come up to us and tell us their experience. Whereas to sit down and email someone, you know, that's a, that's a bigger ask. So, but we have heard, and um, people are pretty excited about the people that already have the older versions of the game are, you know, really excited. And I've had a couple people email me saying they really like the changes because it, it does add a little more depth um, and a little, it take, gets rid of some of the, a little bit of the luckiness that would happen for some other players. Okay. Because you got to watch your battery life. You can't just be wandering around the woods. Oh, good. Real life as well as your game, apparently. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> so if do you have any advice for anybody who may be thinking about creating their own board game? Yeah, play lots of games, play lots of different games. Um, there's so much that's happened in the board gaming world in the last 10, 15 years that it's, you know, it's not Monopoly anymore. Um, 
And, you know, that's one is you, you need to just play a lot of different games to see what things are out there that you like and, and how they work. Um, you know, then it's get something together. It doesn't have to be, you know, pretty, um, and start playing it with other family members and friends. And then once you get it to a point where you think, well, I have something here, you might want to use some clip art. You're not breaking any laws as long as you're not selling it at that point. Then you go out to the local game store and we can do that stuff. Uh, you can try putting it up on tabletop simulator and getting people, get people you don't know to test it. Um, because your friends and families, people, you know, they're going to want to be nice and you need tough critics because you want to find the things that are wrong with it before you send it out to the general public. Cause they'll let you know about it. <laughs> <later. laughs> there's a problem. Um, you know, and so, and then there's just people like, um, there's board game geek. A lot of games are rated and, and the geocaching game is on there and it, and it has, um, you know, pretty good ratings. And, but there's just like one guy who clearly hasn't played the game or bought the game, just heard about it. And he gave it a two out of 10 and said, you know, wandering around the woods, looking for geocaching, get geocaches is like the opposite of geocaching. And I'm like, I'm so glad he made the comment because I'm like, what? <laughs> That's exactly what geocaching is. So he just, I don't, he, I don't think he's ever played it. He's looked at it and said this, you know, and you're going to have those people and it's fine because there's plenty of eights, nines and tens, but it's, you got to, and I tell that story just because if you try to produce a game, that's going to happen and you just have to have tough skin about it and laugh it off. And I, you know, I kind of, it's, you can't make a game that's for everybody, and um, you do the best you can. But yeah, get it in front of people you don't know and test it a lot. That's that's kind of wild that he made that comment because the as soon as you said that, my first thought is that that's exactly what it is. <laughs> Unless you're just doing parking grabs, that's exactly right. what it is. Is you wander around in the woods looking for. <laughs> um, so. He could have just gone on and put a two out of 10 and not made a comment. And that would have hurt a lot more because the comment being there, I think people read it and go, yeah, I don't, I don't think he's played this. So, uh, <laughs> and it, you know, and it proves that we didn't rig all the ratings too. <laughs> so That's true. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, it's kind of funny. So anyway. Anybody that's interested in buying the Cash Me If You Can board game or card game or any of your other games, what is the best place to buy them at? You so, mentioned Amazon, but then they're also available through the, your DPH website, correct? Yes. Yeah, it's just dphgames.com, and we'll ship them out right away. Now, the card game is only through our website Okay. Um, because we make that. Uh, locally, it's we can't wholesale it. It's too expensive to do that. So we sell it through our website um, e on eBay and um, Etsy and uh, or is it eBay? Can't remember. CNC Bargains is on one of those two, um, but they're also on Amazon. So if you search on Amazon, there's two vendors that currently have it there that I'm aware of. Um, although it says second edition, it is not the second edition. It is the fourth edition. I, we cannot get it changed on Amazon for, I don't know. They said, I don't, I don't control it anymore. I talked about the vendors. They don't control it. So we're like, we don't know who controls the title that we can't, that Amazon oh, allows wow. us change. That's yeah. kind of crazy. That's good to know though, for anybody looking at it on Amazon. Yeah, but, it's the same. Well, I'll, I would definitely include the link to your guys' website and show notes so everybody can check out the Cash Me If You Can games and all the other board games that are on there. So normally this is where I would insert the spoiler warning for the cash highlights, but as I did not have a cash ID in this instance, I'm foregoing the warning. Uh, it's still a really fun story and I hope you guys enjoy it. Did you have a cash you wanted to highlight for us? Well, I had a story about a story. one. I'll, I would love to hear it. I don't know if it's still out there, but um, this was my highlight. So I think there was eight of us around this thing. So basically this guy took this safe and put it in a slab of concrete and 
buried it in the ground. So finding, and the, the surface was exposed. So finding it was easy. So there's a tumbler lock with a little key hole and you got to get this thing opened. And the name of it was, oh, it's been so long. It's just, it was called safe like 948 or whatever. And then hang from the tree as a string and a magnet. And so we're like trying 948 and we're going around with the key to the full extent around this thing or with the magnet trying to like, we're going to hit a key with a magnet maybe. And that's how it is. And um, we're tripping all over ourselves. And basically what it was is the tumbler nor the key actually worked. You ba You had to take the magnet and put it on the safe and slide the, um, whatever the bars are in a safe that keep the door oh. closed. Put the magnet on the door and slid it over. The door opened up. <laughs> and we're like, and I'm not sure if that's the same guy in that one, but he had um, he had like an automatic recording that said, hi, I'm a geocache, and started talking to you. Oh. But, <laughs> lots of crazy ones. But, man, you know, we were, it was eight of us just going crazy, and it was somebody who had done it before finally gave in and gave us a hint and we're like, ah, oh. so I love the ones where you're staring at them. It's right there, but you just can't do it. Like you just don't. And then you're like, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it always seems so simple when you know the answer to it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How long did they make you wait it out before they finally gave in and helped you? <laughs> oh, well, it was 45 minutes or so. It was, Oh, wow. <laughs> It was, it was crazy good. So it was just like a like a portable safe or like how big was oh, it? It wasn't, it wasn't portable. They had it. Well, it might have been, but they put concrete around it so no one could take it. So it was buried in the ground and solid. Like you could not. The thing was a vault. So, <laughs> um, yeah, there was not even any temptation to try to move it. So. It's a great way to keep it from being muggled, for sure. <laughs> it, was, it was out in the middle of the woods somewhere, too. It's not like you're going to bring a truck out there and rip it out. Do you remember what was inside the safe when you guys opened it? You know, <clears throat> at that point, I really don't. <laughs> <'Cause it> was, <laughs> getting in there and signing the log, you know. I, I've, I've pretty much, I do a little bit with trackables. It's more the thrill of the hunt for me, um, not so much in the, you know, uh, leaving, take an item, leave an item thing. So that doesn't stick out in my head. It was more of the just solving that. That's fun. <laughs> that's a pretty good story. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. No problem. Well, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast and telling us about DPH games and the Cash Me If You Can games and for sharing your geocaching story. I really do appreciate you taking the time out of your day to do this. No problem. Thanks for having me on. You've been listening to Geocache Adventures with me, Shadow Dragon One. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts or on the Geocache Adventures Facebook page. And if you know any other geocachers that may like this podcast, please share it with them. I really appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Do you have a topic you'd like to hear discussed? Do you have a geocache adventure you would like to share for the cache highlight? Would you like to be a guest on the show? Reach out to me at geocache dot adventures dot podcast at gmail dot com or on the contact page at geocacheadventures.org. You can also check out Geocache Adventures merchandise by visiting the store page at geocacheadventures.org. You can also sign up for the Geocache Adventures newsletter by going to geocacheadventures.org and going to the newsletter page and signing up there. The monthly newsletter will include a list of upcoming podcast episodes as well as behind the episode tidbits and other content as well. Thank you for listening and I hope you've enjoyed the show.